what's on your mind tonight? You got you, you like to share some of your thoughts on uh, what you do? Absolutely nothing. Except <laughs> to say that the 18,000 people that Mary Barra is planning to eliminate from General Motors as salaried workers as a definite criteria. And that criteria is this, that these are people who have over 12 years, they're salaried people, but I'm going to use an hourly term. These are people who all have 12 or more years with General Motors. They're not going to eliminate anybody that has less than 12 years. Now, what that means is <clears throat> the same thing that's going on with the Tier 1 workers in the plant, which is to take Tier 1 workers and give them impossible jobs to do so that they will retire. Mary Barra has decided that both in salaried workers... I did not say management. Screw your heads on to this. Salaried workers with 12 or more years seniority, hourly workers who are tier one. General Motors has initiated the same strategy for hourly workers of Tier 1 status, people who are grandfathered in the tier, to the defined benefit pension plan, and salaried workers who have more than 12 years of seniority with the corporation, are the people they want to get rid of. It's that simple. It is not complicated. No. They want to get rid of high seniority people right. who are the highest cost employees. The highest cost employees. This is the first time in the history of the UAW where salaried workers, I did not say management, get your heads on, and hourly workers who are eligible for the defined benefit pension plan, are being pressured to get out of Dodge. This is simply a cost reduction process. Get rid of the highest cost people, both in salary, and I did not say management, and hourly. This is a cost reduction process. Nothing more and nothing less. The dilemma here with getting rid of management people with 12 or more years of employment with GM is you're throwing away all the accumulated knowledge that these people had in deference to the people who have less than 12 years of employment with GM. With the hourly people, those people who are grandfathered into the defined benefit pension plan, there's another agenda for them. And that agenda is get them the hell out of the plant and get them into the pension plan. Because the wet dream vision of Ford, GM, and Chrysler, and let's just take GM with 14 assembly plants right now, is to populate these plants with permanent temporary employees. That is the wet dream vision. Temporary employees that do not have pensions, who have marginal health care, and who have no idea of what it was 
to work in the Detroit 3 plant 20 years ago. Right. It's that simple. There's nothing complicated about this, folks. It's a right. cost reduction program, regardless of how effective the company will be or how efficient the company will be. This is cost reduction to maximize profit margins. So don't make some big, complicated, oh, this they're trying to do all this Mickey Mouse. No, they're not. They want to get rid of the people with the most time of employment who have a memory of what it used to be like working for these companies. Ford is doing it. GM is doing it. The only thing is General Motors, because the, 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 the press has focused on GM because Mary Barr said, we're getting rid of 18,000 salaried employees. Well, if they're getting rid of 18,000 salaried employees, who's going to do what they were doing? Right. So, so, so the assumption we can make here is this. Given the fact that the dumb fucks who work on the plant floor, who have been convinced in their teams that ten of us should be able to do the work of nine of us, and then when we get to nine of us, we should be able to do the work with eight of us, the dumb fucks, What's going to go on with the man, the salary people is, if you get rid of 18,000 of 200,000 North American salaried workers, which is about 18% of the salaried workforce in GM in North America, and I said North America, I did not say the United States. then those people have to pick up the work of the people who have gone, don't they? So what is the difference when the team is set down with the team leader and says, how can the ten of us do the work of the ten of us with nine people? And don't worry, folks, because that person who's going to kick down the team is not going to get laid off. That's the biggest lie that's been perpetrated on supposedly intelligent American workers that ever was. So all they're doing is they're cutting back on the head count and leaving the work that needs to be done to the people who are left. Now they're doing it to the solid workers, but of course they've been doing it with the hourly workers since 2011. It's called continuous improvement. It's that simple. The problem we have as hourly workers in Ford, GM, and Chrysler is that we're not getting paid for the extra work that we have been assuming. And none of you, including Brian and all the rest of the noisemakers, can see this. You have people producing twice as much. You have a person producing twice as much profit for the corporation as one person did four years ago. But you're not getting paid for it. Right. That's called annual improvement factor. Forget about COLA. COLA goes to the VIBA now. COLA did not go away. Workers did not lose COLA. If you look in the the 2000 and... 15 GM agreement 
paragraph 101D, there's language about cola. Ain't nobody getting it. Well, then where the hell is it going? It is going to the VIBA. So forget about cola. What we need is a annual annual improvement factor raise of five to six percent now. That reflects the twice as much work per worker that is being done that produces twice as much profit. That is where we're getting financially raped. Right. If there are 47,000 people working in GM today, and I think there's probably less than that now, because Shingledecker's plant is getting 200 people from Lansing if they're not already there. Right. Lansing, okay. Lake Orion, and Lordstown. Lordstown, the people who were laid off from Lordstown in the second shift are migrating to Spring Hill. That's where they're going. Oh. We're, we're getting some from Lordstown, Lake Orion, and a bulk right. of them are coming from Lansing Grand River. And, and we're going and to you work where, Marty? Now that's, Marty? That's Scott. That, that's Scott you're talking to. Okay, so, so Scott, you're getting people from Orion. So Orion is also displacing people now? Yep. <clears throat> yes. So Orion, How many are you getting Orion from South? Orion? Not, not that many. We're, I don't know. We haven't got a number yet. Yeah. I know a bulk of, of those 200 people are coming from Lansing, Grand River, Right. Not Delta, but from Grand River. And we are also getting some people from Lordstown and Orion. That's that's all I know. I don't know. I have a okay. No, I got no to break in. Scotty. I got to break in. We're going uh, to go to 830 tonight. We got about 22 more minutes. So I just want people to know I, I extended the time to 830. All right. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm trying to say is that Thank you. a lot of those people from the second shift at Lordstown went to Spring Hill. Now you're saying you're getting some people from Lordstown at Flint. Do I hear you correct. correctly? That's correct. Okay, fine. That's fine. But what I am saying is this. General Motors has 14 assembly plants right now. They don't need Lordstown. And I'm not sure, given the fact that I lived through the Pole Town plant and all the cultural dilemmas and the destruction of a whole area of the city of Detroit to put Pole Town in place, that they've scheduled any real long-term plans for Pole Town. Okay? Right. So that means they well could be closing. They're going to close down one of the plants in Lansing, in my humble opinion, and they're going to close down Lordstown. There's no reason to close down Lordstown because they could move anything into Lordstown and build it. They could do overrun from Fort Wayne Fort Wayne is running full tilt, and they could bring something back from Mexico. But that is not in their plan, apparently, at this point. So my guess is we'll see Lordstown go, and we may well see... Now, Orion is supposed to be making the electronic vehicles, the electric cars. So right. why the hell are you getting people from Orion? Well, one of the reasons is very simple. The electric vehicle in Lordstown 
doesn't have as many parts in it as a combustion engine car does. <clears throat> what do you got? You got a body with a battery pack, two axles, and two electric motors. That's it. That's a whole lot less than a combustion engine with power transfer units through a combustion engine, a transmission, and a drivetrain. You don't need that in an electronic vehicle. All you need is two axles with the motor on each axle. So the probability is that Orion will probably make electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, but I think it's a total goddamn waste of time because vehicles are going to go to hydrogen fuel cells. The electric vehicle is a nonsense vehicle. We never should have made a move. We never should have destroyed the EV1 going back 20 years. <clears throat> because the vehicle of the future is not going to be the electric car. It's going to be a hydrogen fuel cell. The problem we have in our society right now is that the government will not finance hydrogen fuel cell fueling stations. And the government ought to do that. It's not up to the companies to do that or to the damn oil companies. Why the hell does the oil company want to create a hydrogen fuel cell gas station when they're there selling gasoline? Toyota's cooking up something new in their garage. And it's not just any ordinary vehicle. We're talking about a brand new revolutionary hydrogen vehicle. So you may have heard about the Mirai, the hydrogen-powered Toyota vehicle that uses fuel cells to generate electricity. But now, Toyota's come up with something completely different. They're calling it the new hydrogen combustion engine. This technology could be a game changer in the automotive industry. Unlike other manufacturers that have gone all electric, Toyota is taking a different route. But it's not just about being different, it's about being better. So let's dive in. We're going to be talking about Toyota's new hydrogen combustion engine, how it works, and what it means for the industry. We all know that the planet is in a bit of a pickle, and according to GlobalCitizen.org, the transportation industry is responsible for a whopping 15% of carbon emissions worldwide. And it's no secret that traditional combustion engines have been a big contributor to the pollution problem. And while electric cars are definitely gaining popularity, they're not the only solution, some might argue. Enter Toyota's new branch in its diversified carbon neutrality approach, the hydrogen combustion engine. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and has the highest specific energy density of any non-nuclear power source. It's exhaust-free and non-toxic and can be created using many sources, stored indefinitely and shipped relatively easily. Millions of tons of hydrogen are produced and used without incident every year and it's already being used as a power source in buildings, electric cars, forklifts, ships, and trains. So what's the deal with hydrogen engines? Well, they have longer ranges and don't need to be recharged like electric cars. And the only product that comes out of the exhaust pipe is water. That's right, no harmful pollutants. Now, you might be wondering how it all works. All hydrogen engines use a fuel cell, which converts hydrogen into electricity. It's like magic, but with science. And did you know that Toyota began cutting... All right, enough Pat and Toyota on the back. They're not the only ones that are going this direction. Whether or not the domestic automakers are acknowledging it or um, say anything about it at this point, it's completely strategic in reducing their overall cost and labor. Um, with the threat of EV and everything is going electric, comes a 30% reduction in the workforce. And basically the elimination or extermination of tier one agreements because the long-term goal is not going to be electrical vehicles they need the electrical power infrastructure for wealthy individuals to be able to enjoy their mode of transportation where by and large most people that uh, live within modest means will be converted to hydrogen power there are some issues as far as this is concerned the price of hydrogen, the delivery system, even if it's in place. Petroleum companies don't like it. And there's a problem 
um, that they haven't acknowledged, but is really a, a cost offsetting factor is the fact that anybody can make hydrogen if you know how. Hydrogen is not a new one. One of the pioneers in the game was German automaker BMW, which introduced the 750HL back in 2002, followed by the Hydrogen 7 in 2005. BMW's Hydrogen 7 was based on a traditional gasoline-powered 6-liter V12, but with some modifications to burn hydrogen as well as gasoline. It's a dual-fuel engine, and just to make it even cooler, only 100 of these bad boys were ever produced. So if hydrogen emits water vapor and is not harmful to the environment, why has nobody created a hydrogen-powered vehicle to this point? You would think that somebody would have done it, it would have caught on. Here's the problem. Making fuel from water is extremely easy, much more easy than they would like you to believe. This is just water, electricity and some baking soda, and about 29 amps. We found that we can inject this in the state of vacuum into our engine and double our mileage under certain circumstances. Now I'm running a V8 350 and have been for over 30,000 miles. It all starts with the wiring. You get some number 10 gauge wire to conductor and run it to a switch which you put under your dash. I'm using a... The answer is just as simple as why they had not legalized marijuana to this point. Because the companies that sell alcohol would have a real problem if you could purchase something that also gave you some sort of utopian effect, but you could grow it in your backyard. The fact is that all you need to do to create hydrogen is have water, baking soda, and a source of electricity to separate the atoms, H2O. What you want is the H, you don't want the O. When you separate the oxygen atoms from hydrogen, now you have a burnable fuel, and it doesn't take very much voltage to do it. Back in 2007, when the price of gas was high, people were making systems like this in their garage to try to reduce their fuel consumption. Now, the way that the fuel works in your, your uh, fuel injected system is this going to be able to tell whether or not you're burning rich or if you're burning lean, and your vehicle will automatically adjust to the amount of hydrogen that's injected to, into the intake. Now, these systems were all made just like this. Some hillbilly in his garage plumbed it right in. The hydrogen is actually created, generated right at the source that is being used. And so, when the answer comes to, or the question is, why has nobody created a vehicle that burns hydrogen or runs off hydrogen to this point is the fact that the fuel companies and the source of energy used to fuel your vehicle can be generated from the electricity from the running engine. Now, this is also an ICE engine. So when you go back to the auto manufacturers, switching to EV and why the government's paying for the infrastructure is two part. One thing, the electrical infrastructure for the EV plug-in stations is setting the stage for the next generation vehicle that they will travel in. They have to have that infrastructure in place in order for them to have these conveniences and luxuries that by and large, the American public does not enjoy. The other part is that energy and power is one of the biggest lobbies most powerful in Congress. And when fuel companies are giving campaign do uh, donations and contributions to your politicians, they don't want to cut off that source of money. Producing a vehicle that runs off of fuel that somebody can produce, literally produce by themselves or have some add-on feature to this vehicle that prevents you from having to go to a hydrogen fueling station in order to fuel up your vehicle, it causes them to lose a lot of money. So essentially, that's what it comes down to. Now, this is just a makeshift, simple something somebody did in his garage, but you could mass produce and fabricate something on a larger scale that's more compact and more efficient than what this man is doing. And they know this. And they know that people will figure it out. And they know that the aftermarket will supply you with systems that will create hydrogen for you that's safe. The other thing that they, the way that they scare the pe American people away from this is because of something that happened long ago. A communist flag airship burned to cinders in less than a minute and a half. And... Now, later reports are showing that it was sabotage, but it was to show the volatility of hydrogen. So that way it would not be considered as an alternative source of energy. 
The real truth is that this stigma was associated and attached with it, so we never explored the cheapest source of energy from the most abundant resource on the planet. There's actually more hydrogen than any other type of molecule. You can't charge somebody any amount of money for something that is so abundantly plentiful. So how do you prevent people from using it? You got to scare the shit out of them. The hydrogen from applying electricity to water. Water is the fuel. Now under a lot more stress than you ordinarily would be. Hindenburg's. So you said earlier that uh, hydrogen was going to be for normal motorists. What did the rich people plan on doing? Really fly. Really fly? How did they do that? Havoc is on the way. Introducing Havoc Heli from Air Hawks, the world's smallest remote controlled helicopter. Cutting edge micro sized tech. The most amazing thing happened right around this time period in 2007 when discussions over electric vehicles took place. What's really interesting about it is that this technology has been around for a long time, but on a mass scale, the technology began being advanced and R&D uh, going into new flying vessels, which is pretty interesting. They're all drones, they're not manned, but the technology for stabilization and uh, control was all refined through a kid's toy. As with anything, as the technologies developed, people considered more practical applications for it. Now we know what the drone market has become. With drones and quadcopters. Drones and quadcopters have revolutionized flight. They help humans to take to the air in new, profound ways. Today's drones and quadcopters come with mind-blowing capabilities, flight being the least of these. These nifty devices capture dazzling aerial images and enable augmented reality game playing as well. They can go to places humans cannot, enabling them to do much more than thought possible. How these devices developed over the decades is quite fascinating. Their aerodynamic features and uses definitely pique curiosity. So you might ask yourself, what is a drone or quadcopter? The more interesting question is not what is a drone or quadcopter. We all know what that is. The more interesting question is, what will they become? Well, the answer is already here. We're not talking 20, 30 years out. We're talking now. But in order for personal drones to be a reality, there has to be an infrastructure for charging them. So what's the best way to do that other than to have the public pay for it? Plans integrated into their systems. These systems work with global positioning technology. So now you're talking about a fully autonomous GPS vehicle that you get in, you set a point on the GPS, it takes you. Once you have it learned to the memory, you click the home button, it takes you home. You click the work button, it takes you to work. Hands off transportation while you take care of things on the laptop, manage your business, go to the grocery store, whatever you do in your daily life that you have set in the GPS. But the fact is, you got a valet 100% of the time. It's a personal transport in and out easy. If you live in a high rise building and you got a helipad, you got a way to get to your, your place of residence. You know, for wealthy individuals, it's a great deal. But in the short term, you have to have the infrastructure in place to be able to build them. The other side of this is the battery technology development. <laughs> Over the years, technology has revolutionized our world and daily lives. Modern technology has created amazing tools and resources, putting useful information at our fingertips. Some of the most exciting discoveries and inventions have paved the way for technological revolutions, which have made life better and easier. The world has moved from gas guzzlers to electric vehicles, even to self-driving cars. One of the products of advanced technologies, drones, which have been popularly used as entertainment and delivery machines, has now gone above that. The latest upgrade with drones is self-flying passenger drones. The world's first passenger drone, which is capable of carrying a person into the air while it self-drives, has been unveiled in China. Let's take a look into the futuristic world where self-driving passenger drones become a part of the daily commuting. Most of the amazing facts about the passenger drone you don't want to miss are kept at the end of the video. Flying vehicles zooming through the sky and in between skyscrapers seemingly unhindered by gravity has been exclusive to the realm of science fiction for a long time. But flying cars might be dragging themselves out of the sci-fi or fantasy home into the real world. This means that the dream of flying over traffic is now closer to reality. 
the world's first passenger drone, the Ehang 184. Made by a Chinese tech company, Ehang Intelligent Technology made its debut in the southern city of Gongzhou, China. The electrically powered vehicle, the Ehang 184, is operated by an automated flight system, so passengers don't have to bother with driving. All passengers need to do is get into the small cabin and fasten their seat belts, and the automated flight system takes over from there. In a company video showing the Ehang 184 flying, it looks like a small helicopter, but with four propellers spinning parallel to the ground in a similar configuration to other drones. Let me make this clear. The technology for personal passenger drones is already in existence. Several companies are manufacturing them. Some of them can seat up to seven people are considered air taxis, but the big three play no part. So you're going to see a series of intellectual thefts for battery technology, for aviation and autonomous vehicle type technology uh, over the next few years, and an increased amount of regulation to try to regulate out competition. So that's how the big three works. Because they have the capital, they will try to regulate out every other competitor based on safety to drive the price up. These vehicles will not be obtainable by the general public. With air conditioning and a reading light, and also designed to fit with propellers folded in a single parking spot. After setting a flight plan, passengers need only to give two commands, which are take off and land. What does this mean for the existing auto workforce? Well, being that uh, it requires less people to assemble a road vehicle that's electric, um, it actually requires less to build a passenger drone. So of those who are lucky enough to be able to get a job building them, um, you're probably not going to have the skills necessary in order to build these products. Vertical takeoff and landing drone, or VERTOL, is GM's first foray into aerial mobility. We are preparing for a world where advances in electric and autonomous technology make personal air travel possible. It is a concept designed for the moment when time is of essence and convenience is everything. You've been at the office and now you need to get to a meeting across town. The Vertol meets you on the roof and drops you at the Verti port closest to your destination. It uses a 90 kilowatt hour EV motor to power four rotors, as well as air to air and air to ground communications. Which is pretty awesome, but at this point, I don't know that they even have a working prototype. Other companies are already producing these vehicles. Cadillac luxury might look like in the not too distant future. We have other concepts coming, including a luxurious two seater designed for you and someone very special to decompress, relax and enjoy a multi-sensory experience choreographed for more intimate journeys. Each concept reflecting the needs and wants of the passengers at a particular moment in time and GM's vision of the future of transportation. This is a special moment for General Motors as we reimagine the future of personal transportation for the next five years and beyond, leveraging technology to create a consistent GM brand promise while also delivering an unrivaled range of electric vehicles across our brands, each with unique personalities that reflect the unique priorities of the millions of customers we serve. Even if you've never considered driving an EV before, over the next five years, GMC, Cadillac, Buick and Chevrolet intend to present you with a vehicle that you'll fall in love with. But the products he's talking up don't even exist. They're as fake as the clay models of the 1990s. They talk about something that doesn't exist to get your appetite wet for something in the future that turns out to be less than what the renditions and the models are. In the next couple of years, flying taxis will begin to appear in the skies of the largest megacities. These are EV tolls, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts, dozens of new companies are fighting for the opening trillion dollar market, developing their unique designs and entire ecosystems. This type of aviation was made possible thanks to the development of battery density. And now, drones can lift not only the camera, but also a couple of people, transporting them for tens of miles. As of the end of 2021, only a few companies have a full-size working aircraft and are already running demo flights. A dozen more companies will present their aerial vehicles in the next couple of years. And hundreds more startups are still trying to make their first prototype fly. Joby Aviation is currently in the lead, setting the range record for EV tolls with 155 miles. The path to this achievement took 12 years. 
Before Joe BS4, there were several different designs and innovative ideas, 8 patent applications, like this propeller converting into a wing. But eventually came to this shape. However, there will be those, who will write in the comments, nothing new, we've already seen all this before. Boring. New here, is unprecedented flight safety, costs, and noise level. Helicopter has hundreds of vulnerabilities, failure of any of which could lead to disaster. And still, they fly pretty well. EV tolls, can do better. There is zero single point of failure. Distributed propulsion system, independent battery packs, duplicated control systems, wings, and ultimately a ballistic parachute are a guarantee of safety. In the future, the human factor will also be excluded. It is easier to create an autopilot for flying, than for driving around the city. There are fewer surprises in the air. Today the cheapest helicopter flight, costs from $150, for 15 minutes. A similar flight, on eVTOL, will compete in price, with a taxi ride. Let's compare Joby with an electric car. Both have capacity for 5 people, similar weight, and total power. But Tesla, has twice the range, with half the battery capacity. So, is an electric car, four times more efficient, than EV tolls? No. The winged EV toll, consumes less energy per mile than an electric car, especially at high speeds, as flight is more energy efficient, due to less friction. But to meet current safety requirements, Joby will always carry around 30 minutes of energy reserves. Dead weight to keep passengers alive. There is also the strongest energy overrun, during hovering, which is comparable to the Tesla's ludicrous mode. Ludicrous speed! Go! Not just for a few seconds, but for about half a minute, during takeoff, and landing. With the further development of packaging, and energy extraction technologies, electric air transport will become cheaper than traveling in a car. But so far, there is no really mass production of EV tolls yet. The manufacturing cost of one Joby S4, will be more than $1 million. That's a big club and you're not in it. You're paying for the infrastructure, you're paying for everything to make this possible for people who will enjoy it and you will never get to enjoy it. So what happens to the auto industry? Toyota's already committed to hydrogen power. The domestic automakers are the only ones that are claiming to go all EV. And that's so they can reduce the workforce. So eventually they'll end up going back to a nice engine with a cheap workforce. and their enormous wealth are lobbying in Washington to put off the inevitable. But getting back to the reality of our day-to-day -day work life, we have, in my humble estimation, in General Motors, a maximum of about 46,500 people, and I think it's less than that right now. And the sad part of this and of those 46,500 people, at least 20% are long-term temporary workers. That is our dilemma as union people. Our dilemma is to get rid of these temporary workers and get them converted as soon as possible to the same pay scale as everybody else. The problem is, is how the hell do you define same pay scale? You have a tier one worker, you have a tier one worker in progression, 
you have a tier two worker, and then you have a temporary worker in progression. Now, how do we get everybody into the same canoe? As long as we have that stratification, a pay scale, around doing the exact same work, we are fucked up. Now, this has nothing to do with one man, one vote, or any of the rest of that crap. We need to stop the nonsense. A temporary worker, if you look in the GM agreement of 2015, there is a five-year in-progression pay scale for temporary workers. That is an oxymoron. If I'm a temporary worker, why do I have a five-year pay scale progression? And typically, when a person who hires in as a temporary worker gets to about two years in the pay scale progression, they will make that person a Tier 2 worker. Now, what a lot of people are not aware of is, if you have exceeded two years as a temporary, and then they say, oh, God, shingle-decker, we're going to make you a Tier 2. You take a $5 an hour pay cut, don't you? You are aware of that, right? So what they do is they wait for a temporary to get to two or two and a half years. There's a pay scale matrix in the, in, in the back, toward the back of the GM agreement. And when you get to about two and a half years, they say, okay, Don Couch, we're going to make you a tier two. But then you take a $5 an hour pay cut and start an eight-year progression. So now they're really making money on you, aren't they? Yep. Oh, yeah. They're making a ton of money on you. Oh, yeah, you're getting a, a modicum amount of health care. And let's not, let's not even talk about, well, the union now has to represent you because the company doesn't pay for that anyway. And you're going to get a, a modicum of health care. So this whole thing, when we were talking on this show in 2011, and I said, if you vote for this contract, you have no idea what you're doing. You are opening up a pathway to nowhere. And we did just that in 2011. The Tier 1 workers voted to freeze their own pension plan, didn't they? The pension plan yeah. ceased to be because everybody wanted the, the, the signing bonus. In 2015, we talked on this show, and I said, if you vote for this contract... You will be chiseling in stone the doom of the worker in the Detroit Three Plants. And we have done that. And if you look at page eight of the UAW GM highlights, you will see how. Now comes the 2019 agreement, which, like Lincoln's second burial when they put him in the ground they filled the hole with concrete so nobody could dig him up well I can tell you folks this 2019 agreement is going to be just that and they will have realized their dream a plants full of temporary workers and subcontractors and they will have done away with the social contract of employment that Scott Shingledecker has, that Don Couch and I had. 
because we are no longer viewed by these companies or by the UAW as whole human beings. And when I say whole human beings, not just the guy who swipes the card, comes in, does his work, and swipes the card and goes out. I'm talking about the person who they hired who came there to work to build his life. The corporation nor the union gives a shit anymore about our lives as human beings. And that is simply a fact, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna belabor that statement. They don't care about you as a human being. Neither the corporation nor the union. You are just a line item cost item in their business plan. That is our dilemma today. Back in the day, back in the in the late eighties, early nineties, when Al Warren and Roger Smith, the chairman of of GM and Al Warren was the vice president of industrial relations and they were saying employees are our most valuable asset. They do not believe for one minute that employees are their most valuable asset. They believe because of the temporary worker. They don't care about the person's name or their social security number. You'll just come in, do what we want you to do, and get the hell out of here. The sadness of the heritage of working in an auto plant is this. You're no more now than a McDonald's worker in a hamburger joint. And that is a fact, Jack. I'm going to tell you, I don't care what Brian Keller says. I don't care what Tom Laney says. I don't care what any of the noisemakers say on the Facebook pages. We don't. Not because we can't, it's because we don't. Because the people who work in the place today do not believe for one minute that they have the wherewithal through voting for local union representatives, through voting for convention delegates, that they can change anything. They don't believe it for one minute. That is our dilemma. Those of us who are old and about to die, how do we convince these people in the place today? And, Don, you can remember back, fuck, eight years ago I said, don't vote for anybody who's elected or appointed to anything. That's right. Go and sign up yourself. They don't believe for a minute that that will change anything. Now, I've studied psychiatry and psychology for 20 years now since I've been retired. And there's nothing you can say to these people because they are fighting for their own work-life survival. How would you like to be a temporary worker Every day you drive to work, you don't know if you're going to do something that's going to have some man in person walk up to you and say, you're fired. You pay union dues, but you can't get union representation. Now that we can change, and nobody has put a resolution in. Nobody has put a resolution in, in any local to say, if temporary workers are paying union dues, they are entitled to full union representation. Isn't that interesting? And they don't need Brian Keller or any other so-called pundit to represent them. They need the district committee man in a district within which they work to represent them. Now, how did that happen? How did Scott Shingledecker and 
Don Collins and Dick Danson let temporary workers get into these plants, pay union dues, and not have union representation. And we don't even give it a thought. It's just a matter of fact to us now. Well, they don't get union representation until they get to be tier two. Are you kidding me? We are less of union brothers than they are. Believe me. We need to go look, go in the bathroom and look in the mirror and talk to that person you see and say, why did I vote for a contract? that says a temporary worker can pay union dues and not have any union representation. Why isn't the UAW or the, 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 the Department of Labor or the National Labor Relations Board saying, Jesus Christ, you can have you cannot have twenty percent of a hundred and twenty thousand people going into these plants and not have any union representation while they're paying union dues. Where the hell is the Department of Labor? Where the hell is the National Labor Relations Board? This is the sickest system that could possibly exist in our society today when it comes to being a member of a union. I pay my dues but I don't get represented. It's got nothing to do with right to work, does it, folks? No. So how do we deal with these dilemmas, those of us who theoretically understand this stuff? Ah, but here comes the 2019 agreement. Wonderful. And it's going to be just chiseled in titanium, folks. Because the wet dream vision of these companies is factories full of temporary workers. Now, we know that. Gary Jones knows that, the new president of the UAW. The Department of Labor knows that. How the hell do we deal with that? And as far as the joint funds... And the people who have been convicted, yes, yes, you have the guy who was the controller of the Chrysler Training Center, Dearden. He was the he was the finance guy. So he had to handle the money. Okay, no big deal. Then you had this guy Brown and Meckins who are the union and management co-directors of the National Training Center. Well, we had the same thing at GM with a guy named Don Davis who had any number of management partners when I was there. And they were the the day-to-day managers of the center. And then you have a board of directors of the National Training Center and the chairman of the board of directions on each side of the table would be the vice president of the GM department in my day. That was Don Eflin. And, and on the other side of the table, Al Warren, the vice president of industrial relations. And every month those guys met, and they got a report from the head of each joint activity about where they were, what they were doing, how much they spent, and how much they needed. Just like any other corporation. So when you talk about these guys that were convicted, you need to understand where they were in the pecking order. Verdell King reported to Norwood Jewel's top AA, this woman named Johnson. And when Johnson told her, go buy Norwood a shotgun, she said, okay, boss. The problem was Norwood, Johnson, 
and other people were using Burdell King thinking they were insulating themselves. And the more people who use her to buy things for them, the more she knew about what she was buying. Only she didn't have to testify to that because once she used that charge card to buy things for three different people under direction, the FBI would go to the store, get a photocopy of what the hell she bought, and all she had to do was say, yeah, I did that because Johnson told me to. It's not like she was a brainiac. They thought they were insulating themselves. Now, we had none of that crap in GM, I can tell you, because I was one of the first ten people, not even ten people, assigned to the UAW GM Human Resource Center. There were only six of us. <clears throat> but we had a, a, a union and a management co-director. And then as we finally started out in the Fisher Building in three offices and then moved out to Big Beaver Road in I-75 to where we blossomed into 12 different joint activities and then moved into I-75 and M-59 to our 75,000-square-foot three-story building, we didn't have, at least from where I was sitting, that kind of corruption. Not when I was there. And I was there from 1985 to 1985, 6, 7, 8, 1989, when Steve Jokic came into the GM department and he said, I don't want you to do QWL anymore. I don't want you to do joint activities. I want you to go to Saturn. And so I left joint activities and I went to Saturn. But I'm just telling you that because you folks don't really know the history of this stuff. Now, that stuff with Holofield started long after. That stuff with Holofield started about eight years ago. Now, I retired in 1999. And Chrysler made a conscious, purposeful decision that through Holofield, they could buy the union. And anybody that tries to tell me that Marcioni wasn't the, the think tank guy behind this is smoking something. Chrysler set out to buy the union, and they bought them. They bought them. Now, as far as the, 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 the UAW goes uh, with the stuff in Palm Springs and spending a million dollars in these conferences and training centers, that's very different from the, what happened at Chrysler. The corporation made a decision to buy the union, and they bought them. Now, what happened with 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 this this nonsense about Palm Springs and its training centers was that these training centers at GM and Ford are totally financed by the company. And Walter Ruther said many, many decades ago, when the union takes money from the corporation, it's all over. Now, Ford Training Center, Christ, a GM Training Center, we take money from the corporation. We take money from them in that they provide all the money to run the Center for Human Resources down on Walker Avenue and to run the Ford National Training Center in the old Veterans Memorial next to Cobo Hall. All that money comes from Ford and GM. Now, does that mean that there's the same kind of corruption 
that existed at Chrysler? I don't think so. 